you all have. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Elio, for that kind introduction, and especially to all of you uh, for coming this morning. Uh, it's certainly my pleasure to be here with members and guests of the Vancouver Board of Trade. Frankly, I don't need much convincing to make a trip to Vancouver. Such a great city. Lucky you. Comme je suis à Vancouver, je prends soirée mon discours en anglais. Vous pouvez le consulter en français dans le site web de la banque. Et je serai très heureux de prendre vos questions dans les deux langues officielles. Before I go on, I'd just like to take a moment to say hello to some colleagues and friends here in Vancouver. First of all, many of you know Jock Finlayson. Jock is up here at the table. He was introduced a moment ago. He's on the Bank of Canada Board of Directors representing BC. Does so with distinction. Um, also here are some staff members from our local Bank of Canada office, which is just around the corner here. Laurie Rennison, Farid Noven, David Williams, and Kevin Armstrong. And also delighted to see a number of other friends in the room, which was really nice. I see an EDC table, and I know uh, Linda's here, my old, my old colleagues. Of course, that's a really tough gig when you're working at EDC and you get assigned to work in Vancouver. Um, and actually, it turns out it's almost the same thing at the bank, you know. Uh, they, like the, they really like it here, so good for you. Oh, yeah, so one of my golfing buddies is here, Dave, Dave Mills. Hi, Dave. So anyway, uh, this morning uh, my focus is the Canadian economy, and in particular, how it will return to natural growth. Now my story has three parts. Where are we now? Where are we going to end up? And how will we know we are on the right path to get there? Now, I probably don't need to tell anyone here that the recent global recession was the worst downturn since the Great Depression. In very short order, global GDP fell by more than 3%, and millions of jobs were lost. In Canada, almost half a million jobs were lost, and GDP fell by more than 4%. The recession in Canada is now history, of course, thanks in large part to timely fiscal and monetary policy measures. And we were, in fact, the first of the G7 to recover our recessionary decline in output and to start expanding anew. And we've regained all the jobs lost in the crisis and added almost 600,000 more since then. But everybody knows we are not back to normal. Interest rates are at extraordinarily low levels. With unemployment above 7%, there is still slack in the labor market. And the export sector, close to 7% below its pre-recession peak in terms of sales, still has a lot of ground to make up. And there's something else. A characteristic of a naturally growing economy is a steady increase in the population of companies. However, for five years after the start of the crisis, we saw virtually no increase in the population of Canadian companies. Now, this matters a lot. Of course, large established companies provide the foundation of our economic growth. As they grow, we grow. As they become more productive, we do too. Or they generate new ideas, everyone benefits. But it's the creation of new companies that serves as the natural engine for growth. New ideas, new products, new ways of producing them are often the seeds of new companies. And as they grow from one employee to five to 20 and then more, they generate an outsized proportion of new employment. And that's in every economy, not just ours. The new companies create new jobs, which create new incomes, which of course get spent. And that creates the virtuous circle of self-sustaining growth. That's what makes it natural. Although the data on the population of firms are choppy, in the period from 2008 to 2012, 
there was almost no net creation of companies in Canada. Particularly hard hit have been Canada's exporters, who were exposed to the full brunt of the global crisis. Their numbers out and out declined in the recession, and based on their ongoing weak output, have likely remained flat since then. The group most profoundly affected has been manufacturing exporters. Meanwhile, many existing businesses also seem hesitant to make major investments, and no wonder. Yes, there has been significant capacity added in the mining, the oil, the gas sectors. We've seen important long-term investment in such projects as the oil sands, shale gas extraction here in British Columbia, a number of mining projects. Indeed, during the recovery, this activity accounted for fully three quarters of the contribution to growth made by investment in Canada. And it helped return the overall share of business investment in GDP close to historical levels. But companies in other sectors have told us that they have held off on creating new capacity until they see more concrete signs of stronger demand. In the meantime, they've focused on smaller, targeted, or niche projects. In other words, getting the most out of existing capital. But a more normal post-recession evolution would show greater investment in the capital stock of firms across most sectors, not just mining, oil, and gas. Now, in our summer business outlook survey, companies told us that uncertainty, uncertainty about the nature and timing of improving growth prospects is weighing on their investment decisions. Now, much uncertainty centers around U.S. fiscal and monetary policy, Europe's slow emergence from a deep financial, fiscal, and economic crisis, and even the sustainability of growth in China. But other factors also affect business confidence. These would include concerns about Canadian domestic demand, access to credit, uncertainty about regulatory costs or government approvals, Taken together, these various elements of uncertainty create a sort of wedge, a wedge that blocks companies from making optimal investment decisions until they're more sure. Understandably, Canadian firms have been reluctant to add new capacity until the U.S. economic recovery gains traction and is more certain. Now, given what firms have been through, it naturally would take a lot of confidence to expand. However, once there is a shift in sentiment, research shows that business decision makers tend to react and move forward very quickly with their investment plans. When this happens, economists call it animal spirits because it's very hard to predict. But some new data suggest we just might be turning the corner. Recently published private surveys of business sentiment show some improvement. Further, financial market uncertainty has declined, according to Canadian and global indicators. Now, such measures of financial volatility may well be serving as proxies for actual world events or developments, and we'll keep watching them very closely to see if the improving trend is sustained. The bank's interviews with business leaders for our autumn business outlook survey are being conducted right now. So I'm very much looking forward to learning about their views and perspectives, and especially how or if they are evolving. But perhaps the most exciting sign is that the population of Canadian companies is growing again. Now today, there are some 40,000 more firms with at least one employee than there were last year at this time. Now, this pace is considerably stronger than what we would expect in normal, non-recessionary times. And it suggests that we might be replacing some of the firms that were lost during the recession with new ones. And this is excellent news. We also know that most of the jobs that have been created since the recession are in occupations requiring relatively high skill levels 
and are mostly in industries with above average wages. What this will do is to help contribute to that virtuous circle of higher incomes, more spending, and more jobs that we associate with natural growth. So all of these signs are hopeful. They're signaling that we are on our way home. So let's talk about that now. What does home look like? This is a discussion about the future, so there are many unpredictable variables. But I anticipate that the Canadian economy will normalize and growth will become natural in contrast to the economic activity of the past six years, which has been fueled by policy, including record low interest rates. Natural growth will be self-generating, self-sustaining, and the economy will be growing at its potential as its productive capacity expands. Inflation will be back to our target of 2%. And as I've said before, policy rates in Canada will be higher than they are today. We can expect that short-term interest rates, as is normal, will be above inflation, and long-term interest rates will settle into place along a natural upward sloping yield curve. We can also anticipate a better balance in Canada between domestic and foreign demand. All components of GDP will contribute to growth, again, as normal. The unemployment rate in Canada can also be expected to come down to a more natural level. Consumer and government debt loads will be on a sustainable path. And, of course, firms will be generating self-sustained growth. So ladies and gentlemen, what I've just described, at least from an economist's point of view, that's utopia. That's what home sounds like. But in addition to those very familiar elements, some things will look different when we get home. We might be trading with new customers in new markets. Emerging markets are becoming much more important to our exporters. Canadian companies have done a lot during this cycle to diversify into emerging markets which of course are a growing, although still small, piece of our total trade. The nature of trade is also changing, so it will look different when we get home. More and more exporters are part of global value chains. Today, an exported good, a component if you will, to the United States can ultimately end up being re-exported to more than 100 other countries as part of that global supply chain. Research shows that companies that are part of a global value chain, because they've specialized, have higher productivity, and that delivers better paying jobs. Now the mix of what we trade externally and what we sell here in Canada has already begun to evolve, and undoubtedly that too will be different when we get home. The future will likely include a shift in the shares of manufacturing and services in the economy. Commodities may constitute a larger share than they do today. The sectors with the greatest anticipated job growth will be both traditional and new. On the one hand, mining, oil, gas. On the other hand, computer system design services. Employment is expected to grow steadily in healthcare and transportation. And when we get home, we also have to be ready for surprises, especially among new emerging businesses. For example, in 1971, when the first microprocessor was invented, we didn't even have microcomputers. Look what's happened since then. Just as new technologies and industries emerged from previous recessions, this return to natural growth will include the development of new technologies, new firms, new jobs. Whole new sectors will take off. Descriptions of new classes of jobs will be written. People will be hired under brand new, yet to be defined job titles. So for instance, until recently, who would have thought of a social media expert, or a professional blogger for that matter, as careers for our kids? Well, I'm not gonna try to predict what new product, service, or technology will deliver the next big boost to our economy and the labor force, but there are sectors that have the potential for truly groundbreaking innovations. 3D printing. The reality today, I've seen it done. Artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, many others. 
But let me shift gears and talk about how we get home. How do we get to natural growth? What's the path? How will we know when we're on it? Well, I've suggested before that there is a sequence of events that we can anticipate, that foreign demand will build, our exports will strengthen further, confidence will improve, existing companies will expand their production, companies will invest to increase capacity to do so, and new companies will be created. And evidence suggests that we are now close to the tipping point from improving confidence into expanding capacity. We are seeing improvements in foreign demand, that's for sure. The bank expects that strong increases in U.S. business and residential investment will particularly benefit the sectors of Canada's export market that thus far have lagged, including machinery and equipment and, of course, wood products. Long-term interest rates have recently begun to return to more normal levels. Consistent with the strengthening U.S. economy, and the anticipation that the U.S. Federal Reserve will begin to ex exit from its unconventional monetary policy. But it's very important to make the distinction between policy tightening and a slowing of the rate at which additional stimulus is being provided. Talk about tapering refers to the latter. I sometimes use a spaghetti sauce model to help explain this. This, of course, is because economic models, the more complicated they are, the more likely they are not to give you a good answer these days because the world has changed so much. So simpler sometimes is better. But when the bubble burst in 2008, we were left with a crater. And that's where we find ourselves today. If you look carefully, very carefully, mind you, at a pot of simmering spaghetti sauce, under every bubble, you'll see there is a crater. And quick, quick prize for those who know how, how big is the crater. It's exactly the same size, not almost the same size. It's exactly the same size as the bubble. As you can see, it's not a very sophisticated model. So as I see it, we had a seven-year bubble, so we'll have about a seven-year crater. And as you know, uh, the media have said, so I'll talk a lot about the five-year anniversary of when all this began. So we still have some time to go. Central banks have been filling that crater with liquidity. Think of it as water if you want. It's certainly liquid. So that we can row our boats across the crater. And we need to make sure that we're getting to shore, not just hitting some rock somewhere away from shore. But when we do get to the other side, when we get home and can climb out of the crater, central banks can gradually reduce the rate at which they add liquidity. That's not policy tightening. Rather, it's another welcome sign that things are getting back to natural growth. And it indicates that the underlying momentum of the US economy is expected to hold. Further, the efforts of Canadian businesses to diversify into faster growing emerging markets will pay off and will also help Canada's export performance. Exports to non-OECD countries more than doubled over the past decade. They now account for 13% of total exports. This growth has added roughly $38 billion to our exports, which is real money. And it's equivalent to adding a big market bigger than the province of Nova Scotia to our economy in just a decade. Now, indeed, the bank projects a solid pace of further improvement for our exports. And this gathering of momentum should help lift the confidence of Canada's exporters and lead to more and more broadly based capacity building investment. It should provide additional incentives for new startup businesses. Now, historically, the lag between an improvement in exports and the ultimate pickup in investment has been around six months. Certainly, the preconditions are in place. The balance sheets of Corporate Canada are healthy. The cost of capital, low. And credit appears to be accessible. The corporate environment overall is favorable. Depending on which international consultant you believe, Canada is either one of the top five or one of the top three or even 
the top two places in the world to launch a business. Stronger investment will mean more new jobs will be created. It means more capital and better tools for workers, and of course, that will increase labor productivity. Now, it means more efficient ways of working and producing our products and services, and it means a resumption of the natural growth in the number of firms being created, and more innovation and more creativity. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the virtuous circle at work. This is what the bank wants to see, and in fact, it's what we expect to see. Now, as firms gain confidence in the pickup of demand, they will invest more, which by definition adds to supply. In short, new demand will create new supply. This is an important dynamic. As global demand improves and investment growth strengthens, we should see higher potential output growth for Canada. What that is is an increase in the speed at which the Canadian economy can grow without causing inflationary pressures. With potential output higher and growing faster in response to stronger investment, the output gap, which to us is the gap between what the economy is capable of producing and what it is producing, could close later or more slowly than if investment and ultimately potential did not respond to the increase in demand. So the message here is that the economy should be able to support stronger activity without stoking inflation as investment ticks upward. Such an endogenous response of potential to stronger demand would be natural, given the slack that we see in our labor market. So the bank will monitor closely these various indicators, including investment, productivity, labor participation, and inflation, to determine the strength of potential output growth and the size of the output gap and the labor market gap. Rest assured, we will conduct monetary policy that is appropriate and consistent with achieving our target of 2% inflation. So let me wrap up. Many of the conditions needed to support a return to natural growth are already in place in Canada. These include a sound macroeconomic framework, a stable financial system, a well-educated workforce, and abundant natural resources. We are optimistic that the gathering momentum in foreign demand, especially in the United States, will help lift the confidence of Canada's business leaders and exporters. We can expect the emergence of new products and new processes, new structures, new industries. In short, a resurgence of the creation side of the creative destruction process that we attribute to Joseph Schumpeter. It may be slow in coming, but it will emerge naturally, and it will serve as a driving force of our economic growth. The bank is absolutely committed to keeping inflation predictable, stable, and on target. This is sacrosanct. Our flexible inflation targeting framework is the best contribution that monetary policy can make so that Canadian households and businesses can make decisions about their financial future with confidence. In short, this is what we can do to help nurture a return to natural economic growth in Canada. I thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Governor. Uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Polos has agreed to take some of your questions. I will alternate between the microphones to my left and right, and we'll have the questions from the audience read by one of our representatives of our financial institution sponsors. If you do have a question, could you please raise your card high so uh, our Board of Trade staff can see you and collect them? To start our Q&A, we will have a representative from one of our sponsors read a question at the microphone to my right. Okay. Hope it's a good one. I think it is, Steve. <laughs> 
Something to do with fixed or variable. I'm oh my sure. goodness. <laughs> fixed or variable exchange rates? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Good morning, Governor Polis. Good morning, my old colleague, Linda. Linda from EDC, and I have a question from the floor. Hopefully I can read it. With tapering a good possibility as early as today, and the head and the huge impact the U.S. has on Canada, can our interest rate policy be independent, or are we so tied to the U.S. that our policy depends on what they do? Well, that's an excellent question. I mean, uh, the, the two economies are clearly very interdependent. And uh, I mean, if they weren't, I don't think we'd be having this conversation because the two economies were very different at the time when the crisis hit. At the time, it was popular for people to talk about how the rest of the world could be decoupled or immune to what was going on in the United States. Uh, and of course, that theory was destroyed by the experience in which we had the most synchronized global downturn in history. Um, so that ties us together. But that's a fundamental which is tied together. That does not mean that monetary policies need to mimic each other. And as you can see, we've had a substantially different monetary policy in Canada compared to the United States. And I think that independence is, is there as it always will be as we target inflation. But if it turns out that inflation in the two countries is about the same and where natural growth rates are emerging in, in, at around the same time, then it may indeed look like our policies are very similar. But at this stage, we simply don't know. We need the fundamentals to evolve, and then monetary policy will react appropriately to ensure that we keep inflation on our target. Our next question, Dean. Okay. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Dean. Dean Kirkham from BMO Financial Group. Yes. What will the return... One of, my, one of my ancestors once was the president of Bank of Montreal. Did you know that? I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I like that. George Stephen. Nice. There you go. Governor, what will the return to normal mean for the Canadian dollar? Uh, well, the Canadian dollar, that's, uh, that exchange rate question is always the most difficult question for any economist. And uh, in a brief, I'll tell you why. If an economist writes down what he or she thinks is a, a reasonable model of how the economy behaves, the exchange rate appears in a lot of places. It affects people's decisions, decisions to, to purchase things as a consumer, decisions to invest as a company. It influences a lot of things in the model. But there's no single thing that says, this is what the dollar will be tomorrow or, or next year. What happens actually is that the dollar is kind of like the ultimate residual variable that kind of comes out of the analysis. And the implication is that everything in the economy affects the dollar, and not just our economy, but other economies. So the consequence is, the truth is, I'd have no idea. Uh, and, and so I may probably should just leave it at that. But, but, uh, but to, you know, to fill in the blanks a bit more for you, I mean, it's clear that uh, you know, we, we all say things like, oh, uh, higher oil prices tend to be associated with a stronger Canadian dollar. Well, that's one of the things we discover from that model. We can, we can test the model and it says that. And so certainly the experience we've seen would, would reinforce that finding. Uh, but that isn't the only thing, and it's really not a guide to what the dollar might be when we get back to normal. So um, I think uh, the markets always get the dollar right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your question, Dean. And I wasn't kidding about George Stephen. George Stephen uh, was, you know, the guy that built the CPR, first president of the CPR. It's my great grandfather's uncle. <laughs> Seriously, that's why. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> So that's my, uh, that's my uh, mother's family name, Stephen. Okay, anyway, enough of that. A distraction. You Governor, have a question. Thank you very much. Uh, Doris Orr, SVP Risk at Van City. A ah. uh, question from the floor is household debt levels have mm -hmm. reached a new high. Yes. And many of us with uh, young children are really feeling it. What risks do they pose and what policy actions, if any, are being considered to encourage a gradual reduction? Right. 
Well, uh, I said uh, that the, us getting home, that return to normal, would include a more sustainable debt path, both for governments and for households. Uh, the fact that in the recent data we just received, uh, a new record was set, it, it's just been a high number for quite a while. So effectively, households are the ones that got us out of the recession with really low interest rates. They, they bought houses sooner than they normally would have. They bought cars, they, they did their thing. And right now we have what I would say is tired consumers with a lot of debt. What that does though, it's not about what the level is. What it does is it makes us more vulnerable to a shock of some kind because you can't just then say, oh, I'll just borrow some more to, to buy more. Uh, at least I don't think so. So what our, our forecast would say is that as the economy continues to gather momentum, households will just continue to make their contribution to the economy and that debt ratio will gradually decline. Um, how gradually is, it just depends on how fast the economy grows. But credit has slowed, credit growth has slowed a lot. Any banker in the room will tell you that uh, for households. Uh, so it's obvious that people have become more cautious and more careful and the bankers are, are doing their job which is to make sure that uh, you can survive say a, a two percentage point rise in rates before someday when you renew your mortgage, that kind of good uh, thinking that's just doing arithmetic. So um, we, we can see the prudence in there and I think that uh, whether the numbers go in a straight line or not is not really that important. What matters is the, the downward trend that we're, we're looking for that has rolled over and we expect to see it continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Tim. These are good questions this morning. With this many people, the odds are you'd get a good question, right? We're at, the, uh, we're at the end of the bell curve, right? Yes. Good morning, Governor Tim Manning, RBC, and you can't come to uh, Vancouver without talking about real estate at some time, so here's the question from the floor. Okay. How big a concern is the price of Canadian real estate relative to domestic wages? Well, that's a funny way to put that question, Tim. Mm -hmm. Can I rephrase it? You can certainly rephrase it. Uh, I know that, especially uh, here in Vancouver, people are very, uh, very sensitive to how expensive it is to enter the market, and uh, you know, people talk about how far can you drive. You know, in some cities you can drive a really long ways. Uh, here, while you eventually hit hit a barrier, you're, there's, you can only drive so far. And so, um, I, I think uh, I have to look beyond that and say that uh, it seems to me that. Uh, what we've been through has given a good support to the price of housing. And uh, what, we're, what we're seeing is the, the natural outcome is one where it kind of cools off, which it has done, without causing a problem for the sector. So what I call a soft landing, if you like. And soft landings never look like they're in a straight line. They're kind of, you know, a little bit like this. So one month you think it's bouncing back and the next month it's back down. Um, but that sort of outcome is exactly what we'd expect to see, um, maybe with a bit of a bulge in housing in the near term because people see interest rates starting to rise and so you might get a little bit more activity. But to me, it looks like the housing sector is, is close to its normal level. I can't judge about price levels. That's a very hard thing uh, to, to analyze. But if we get the evolution as I've described, then I think what you see is what you get. It'll still be expensive to buy a house in Vancouver when we get home. Good, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Morning, Governor. Paul Malaya from HSBC. Mm -hmm. Great presentation, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, the question is, uh, improved demand seems to be coming from developed nations. Mm -hmm. How do you see emerging nations playing their role in the global growth and in the return to, no, to natural growth at home in Canada? Well, that's a, good, that's a very important role. Um, emerging markets today are, are contributing approximately half of global economic growth. Um, and in fact, as we know, uh, when, when say China is growing at 7%, that's, that's adding a, a significant chunk of new demand to the world economy every single day. It's only one place. Uh, people fuss about whether it's growing at 8% or 9% or 7%. And like, because it's gotten so big, 7% growth today is something like 10% five years ago. 
in terms of how much more demand is being added to the world every single day. Demand for things that, uh, and services that we produce here. So it's very exciting and I think uh, the fact that companies have, have begun to diversify into those markets will attach us to those growth rates more and more. And furthermore, our trade with the US, as I alluded to, is very often linked as well because we're part of a value chain with a large US company and that US company is selling into all the emerging markets as well. So we're indirectly benefiting two ways. So uh, I think that uh, the, the difficulties the emerging markets have gone through in recent weeks are just that. They're kind of volatility, and uh, they're managing them quite well. Uh, that sort of volatility is natural when, uh, when you kind of have a period of stability. Financial market participants uh, invest heavily in the, the sure bet. And then what happens as soon as something changes, they begin to unwind that leverage quite abruptly, and it's nothing real about it. It's primarily a financial adjustment. And the fundamentals of those markets are strong. So all that adds up to a good thing for us, and it's worth getting on the plane to look for that new deal in India or China or Brazil or Mexico, wherever it is you uh, are headed. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. I think we have time for uh, one more. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. Stephen Vermette, TD Bank. Stephen with a PH. Same as me. Uh, what's the Governor's outlook on the U.S. economy over the next 24 months, and how does he see the acceleration of that economy impacting prospects for Canadian businesses, and as well, if you could comment on the impact of China as well? Okay, so the, the U.S. economy is clearly healing. I mean, we, we've had an immense adjustment for household balance sheets. So uh, where we talked about Canadian consumer debt today, that's where the U.S. was when all this began, and they have adjusted down significantly and are much stronger position now to drive, to drive growth. And so what I expect to see is all the cylinders in the U.S. Uh, contributing, but bear in mind that none of this ever goes in a straight line. You must think of it as a healing process. You know, it kind of goes for a while, then you get excited, and then, of course, it eases back. It won't be like that. It will be more of an ebb and flow thing. And, and I said, seven-year bubble, seven-year crater. So we still have some time to go before all that healing is actually done. But we're getting encouraged by those signs. And uh, so that growth rate can only conti continue to gradually build up. Um, and that, of course, is shared by everybody. You know, in the years when uh, China was growing at 10%, it wasn't because they did it all by themselves. A massive amount of that was because the U.S. economy was growing far above normal uh, and, uh, and during the bubble formation period. So something more normal is around 7% or possibly 8% for China, and they're growing around that now, and it's shifting to domestic demand, so much more import-intensive. So all of that augurs well for, for all of us, because we are all intimately connected, and we're all just doing it at different times. But we'll all get home at some point. We just may not all get home at the same time, because we're, we're starting at different places. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to formally thank you again, Governor Polos, for taking the time to speak to the business community today. Uh, as our new Governor of the Bank of Canada, yours is a crucial role at the central bank's decisions affect every one of us in the room, in some cases directly. Thank you very much for being with us today. We'd like to uh, present you with a very small token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on a personal note, I, uh, I have to thank you uh, for demystifying something that uh, has been troubling me for a long time. I could never understand why my mom was so good at economics. Uh, I thought she was just making Sunday dinner. So thank you. Okay. In closing again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, RBC Royal Bank, BMO Financial Group, Van City, Coast Capital Savings, HSBC Canada, TD Group, Export Development Canada, and our media sponsor, the Vancouver Sun. Now please relax, enjoy your breakfast, visit the booths at the back of the room, and take this opportunity to network with those around you. Uh, again, Governor Polos, thank you for a very engaging
conversation. Thank you for making this your Western Canadian stop. Uh, it's really neat to see, and thank you for keeping your hands steady on the controls. You and your pre predecessors have done a great job, and please join me again in a thunderous round of applause. Of thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. That's why I get my iPad. Thank you.